Tonight, we'll tell you everything to be afraid of, everyone to hate, and exactly how to think. This is News Blues. Good morning. Before I go any further, I just have to say um, what beautiful worship and what powerful words this morning in those worship songs. Can we give them a hand for helping lead us in worship? It's so good. It's good to be with you this morning. Um, I am sick. I'm going to try and power through, so sorry if I have to cough or anything like that. But uh, let's get right into it. Uh, Topic is news blues. I have a confession to make. I grew up a news junkie. Uh, Is anyone else in here a news junkie? Okay, my people. I was particularly fascinated with the format of television news. Because at the same time, every day or night, on multiple channels at the same time, these people would come into your home and read stories of what's going on locally and globally, and they'd have footage. And it would always be interesting to me to flip channels and see a slightly different angle or a different interview. You guys know what I'm talking about. Whenever there's a high-speed pursuit, we flip through all the channels to see which helicopter has the best action shots, yes? All right. My mom will call me and tell me which one to watch. But we trusted these anchor men and women, these TV news personalities that came into our home. And some became like trusted family members. Some even had their own catchphrase. Let's do a little quiz right now. Let's see if you can match the catchphrase with the news personality. Are you ready? ready. You, you don't sound ready. It's 10 a.m., people. It's not that early. All right. Here we go. Good night and good luck. That would be Edward R. Murrow. Now, that one's a little before my time, maybe a little bit before your time, but it's so famous, I'm aware of it. Uh, let's do a local one. From the desert to the sea to all of Southern California, a good evening. That would be local legend Jerry Dumphy. Used to be with Eyewitness News, Channel 7. How about this one? And that's the way it is. Yeah, it's a terrible Walter Cronkite impression, but it is perhaps the most famous sign-off of all Walter Cronkite. Let's do one more. Stay classy, San Diego. Yeah, the inimitable Ron Burgundy. (laughs) See, we trusted these figures, maybe with the exception of Ron, to be calming influences as they brought information into our lives. That was the news. That was the format. But somewhere along the way, within the last 20 years, the information that came into our homes has transformed into outrage being sprayed into our homes with the strength of a fire hose. The news bite was replaced with news spite. And the impartial anchor has been replaced by partisan cheerleaders. So you used to watch the news to get information. Now you watch the news to get angry or depressed or overwhelmed or hopeless. Proverbs 15.30 says, good news makes for good health. Well, I submit to you that Taking in the news as it's being disseminated to most of us today in these channels is doing the opposite. It's making us sick, mentally unwell, unhealthy. I'll tell you what I mean. If I came up to you after church and I said, hey, I'd like to come into your home for two or three hours today and do nothing but say things that make you angry and sad for a couple of hours, you would probably say, uh, no thanks. But we willingly turn on the TV to news channels and programming that does that to us daily. And today I want to talk to you about how letting that influence in affects our physical and spiritual well-being. Now you may wonder if I'm going to get political or partisan. The answer is no. I have zero interest in doing that. You may wonder why I'm talking about this in the first place. I mean, this is not your typical Sunday sermon. The answer to that is this. Um, Every time before I speak uh, up here, I know it's coming up for a while. And I always pray that God will give me the topic that he wants me to speak on and make it obvious to me. 
And a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to a friend who was in a dark place. And when I asked what was wrong, he said, I was struggling already. And then I got up, I didn't even get out of bed, and I turned the news channel on. And I just kept watching and watching. And it was so much bad news. And it just kept going, and I kept watching, and I felt hopeless, so much so that I didn't get out of bed all day. And when I heard that, I felt God placing that on my heart to talk about. I kept praying about it, because I was trying to make sure, because you know, it's a, it's a weird topic. But I'm convinced that that's exactly what I'm supposed to speak on today. Now, it's a hard one to write because you can't exactly do a Bible word search for CNN or Fox News, but I do believe the Bible has something to say about how we handle all this. So I went over to my friend's house, and I was trying to cheer him up, and I was fixing a couple things on his smartphone for him. And in the 30 minutes that I had his smartphone, he got no less than three push notification headlines from his news app. And these notifications were sensational, inflammatory, and meant to provoke outrage. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that that's bad news. And I don't just mean it's bad information, it's hard information to hear, or it's sad to hear. I mean the way it's presented and its effects on us is bad news. And the first thing that bad news does is bad news divides. Now, I've gotten into the habit of trying to get a, a handle on all the different perspectives now to try and sort out the truth. So I'll read stories on CNN's homepage, followed by Fox, followed by an independent news source. And you know what it's like? It's like watching Star Wars from the perspective of the rebels, the Empire, and some impartial droid on a distant planet. Now, if you want to be particularly thorough in an attempt to be unbiased, you can always read a foreign perspective. <laughs> and you can even go on Twitter and read the tweets of people who hate you and your entire system of government. <laughs> it's back. So, which news organization is the empire and which are the rebels? It's a trap. That's a trick question. None of the news organizations are the good guys or the bad guys. They're all this guy. And I know, we switched from Star Wars to Star Trek. It's the Ferengi. It's all about greed. It's all about money. The Fox News slogan used to be fair and balanced. There's no such thing anymore. They actually dropped that motto in 2017. And I think more interesting than that are that there are people in Fox News that you see reporting on your screens every day that don't believe the things that they say and don't vote the way the majority of their viewers vote. Conversely, there are closeted people at CNN that can't express their feelings on certain issues. And both news organizations have news stories that they will bury and you will never see because it does not fit their brand and it would be commercially damaging. These modern day news organizations, even independent ones, are businesses. They make money off of ads and advertisers. Most are owned by parent companies with products and business interests. And the things that you see and don't see are all based on what brings in the most money for these organizations. I was in film school in the 90s. And in one of our television classes, they had tapes of leaks of footage that news organizations did not broadcast because it didn't fit their narrative or it changed the public perception of a personality or a political candidate. And that was eye-opening. That was the 90s. I can only imagine what you don't see today. Bad news divides. It wants us to take sides. It wants us to see complicated issues from oversimplified, myopic viewpoints. Bad news divides, but the good news unifies. Now notice I didn't say good news, I said the 
good news. The reason we're all gathered here today, the gospel unifies. Gospel literally means the good news. And the gospel that we preach is for all people. We preach Christ crucified and resurrected. We preach freedom from sin and death and hell. We preach the good news of eternal life and abundant life. And the good news that we preach is for all people. It is not divided down party lines. It is not red or blue. Ed Stetzer, who's the Dean of the School of Missions, Ministry, and Leadership at Wheaton College, and also Executive Director of the Billy Graham Center, said this. Jesus is not coming back on Air Force One. And he's not coming back riding a donkey or an elephant. For Christians to be all in on any politician or candidate is literally dangerous to their faith. We're told in 2 Peter 3.9 that God wants all people to come to repentance. And in Luke 2.10, when the angels announced the good news to the shepherds, they said that they brought good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. See, bad news gets us thinking along divisive party lines, us versus them. But the good news should have us thinking about all of God's children who need to hear the good news. Paul said in Romans 10, 12, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. And he further clarifies in Colossians 3 that all who accept the good news said in this life it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. There are no party lines in Christ. There should not be a Fox News life group and a CNN News life group. But see, we've been so swayed by the bad news but sometimes we don't want to hear this. I mean, we like to read verses like Colossians 3.11, and we keep them in this safe little compartmentalized place in, in our minds, this, this old history. We go, well, see, isn't that great? Christians can even get along with barbarians. God is so good. <laughs> that's, that's what it sounds like in my head. But when we come back to 2019, there are some people who say that, and maybe even people in this church who will then angrily say, I don't know how someone could claim to be a Christian and back this guy. Or I don't know how someone could claim to be a Christian and vote this way. Because bad news makes enemies. We have been taught, we have been conditioned by these news sources that those who disagree with us are enemies. There is no middle ground anymore. You're either right or left extreme or radical on both sides of the argument. Now listen, before we go any further, I need to say this. I hope when you go into the ballot booth, and I do hope that you go into the ballot booth, you don't go in as a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent. I hope you go in there as a Christian. And I hope that you make the best decision possible after prayer and deliberation of what you think God would want you to do. Now that said, there's still always gonna be some disagreements even between God's people. But just because you disagree with someone's beliefs or values does not make them the enemy. See, bad news is encouraging us to make enemies out of each other for profit. And in doing so, they're making many Christians that get caught up in this nonsense act like Pharisees. Because they're making us see God's creations, each and every one whom he loves dearly, as enemies. An interesting thing happened recently. You may have seen this. There was a Dallas Cowboys football game. And in one of the luxury boxes, former President George W. Bush and talk show host Ellen DeGeneres were seated next to each other. And there's video and photos of them smiling and interacting with one another. It's pretty innocuous, really. But the response online was filled with hatred and vitriol on both sides. 
And the cries were similar. How can you even be around someone, let alone be kind to someone who has opposite values of you? How could you be nice to this person? Your action of laughing with and being friendly to this person validates their values and undermines everything that we stand for. It sends a terrible message, you're a sellout. I mean, really? Really? We're going to bristle with hate? At Ellen DeGeneres? We're going to bristle with hate at George W. Bush? I mean, I could understand if it was Charles Manson and Hitler. <laughs> but George Bush and Ellen. But see, this is what bad news has conditioned us to. We have been conditioned to bristle with hate with those who we disagree with. And that is just about the most unchristian response that I can think of. Because I serve a risen Savior who dined with sinners and tax collectors. And if you bristle with hate because someone you like or support has interaction with or is kind to someone you disagree with, that is not very Christ-like. And I wonder, would you have had that response when Christ reached out to sinners? Like we read in Matthew 9. 10 through 12. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call the righteous, not sinners. Bad news makes enemies. The good news makes peace. How can we share the gospel with everyone if we can't stand to be around anyone who's different than us? The author of Hebrews writes, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And the Apostle Paul writes a little bit about this at the end of Romans 12. He says, never pay back evil with evil. Do things in such a way that everyone, everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Bad news makes enemies. The good news makes peace. Speaking of peace, bad news robs you of it. Not just peace between individuals, but bad news robs you of your inner peace. Because bad news creates fear. See, the people behind bad news are masters of fear mongering. Why? Because they know that fear paralyzes people. And the more paralyzed you are, the more you're gonna watch. See, we're gonna build up this fear in you but keep watching, because we're surely the only ones that have the answers to alleviate that fear. But while you're waiting for the answers to alleviate that one fear, let me tell you the next 10 things that you need to be afraid of are. You guys know this. Whether it's physical fear, there's a reason why the saying in the news industry is, if it bleeds, it leads. Or how about the local telecasts? You know their commercials. What terrible thing that can kill you and your entire family is lurking in your kitchen and you don't even know it. <laughs> Spoiler alert, it's my cooking, all right? <laughs> but there's something new like that every day. And bad news thrives on political fears. Now, I've got an interesting perspective on this. I came out of Hollywood, so I've still got a lot of friends in the industry and in the arts. And I've been in the church world for 15 years, so I've got a lot of friends on the other side of the spectrum as well. And it was funny, slash sad, slash cringy, slash face palming inducing to watch. After the 2008 presidential election, I had one group of friends that were crying, ah, the sky is falling, everything is terrible, life will never be the same, we're all in trouble, ah! because their candidate didn't get elected. And then in 2016, the other group of friends were all crying, the sky is falling, everything is terrible, life will never be the same, we're all in trouble, ah! Because
because their candidate didn't get elected. Try being a libertarian. Your candidate never gets elected. <laughs> it's funny, though. Christians who are losing their minds over who gets elected or who doesn't. Have they forgotten the verses that say things like this? Everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. Or, the Most High has power over human kingdoms. He gives them to whomever he wishes. I mean, either God's in charge or he's not. Either God knows what he's doing or he doesn't. Unless we don't believe those verses. I mean, I suppose if you wanted to respond biblically as a Christian, if you were still upset, you could put on sackcloth and ashes and walk down PCH. I don't know. But see, we waste so much time fearing our new potential overlords instead of actually spending time in reverent fear of the Lord. Because bad news fear mongers. See, whether these terrible things happen or not, bad news will tell you that they will. And they will rob you of your hope and your peace and your joy. Bad news will tell you the worst of humanity so you have trouble sleeping at night. I actually have an easier time falling asleep after watching a horror movie late at night than I do after watching the 11 o'clock news. But I get it. It's never been worse, right? I mean, we hear about it every day. Sex cults that have infiltrated the mainstream, political corruption throughout the system and at the highest levels, wars and riots and revolutions, apostasy, Christian persecution at an all-time high, and who knows what comes next. So no wonder we're so afraid, right? Except those headlines aren't from 2019. Those headlines are from 30 to 90 AD at the time the New Testament writers lived. And let me tell you, the Christian persecution at the hands of Nero was a lot worse than the Christian persecution we're facing in America today. Though we do have brothers and sisters experiencing horrible persecution in other parts of the world. See, it's always been this way. Sin has always done damage. Satan has always been working. There's always been terror and fear and terrible things happening. There's always been the next big fear and the sky is falling moment in every realm of our lives. But the interesting thing to me is that when you know all of this is going on during the writing of the New Testament, so little of the New Testament focuses on these things or actually references them. Why? Because their focus is on the good news. Their focus is on the good news of eternal life through Jesus Christ. These guys saw their resurrected Savior conquer death and hell and rise again. And Paul wrote in Romans 8, 38 and 39, For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, nor any scary thing, he didn't write that last part, I did, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Folks, God is bigger and stronger and mightier than anything we see on the news that scares us. Or do you not believe that? I find this interesting. In John chapter 16, Jesus is describing some pretty gnarly stuff that's going to happen, literal bad news, and he's telling his disciples. But he puts it in context. And in verse 33, Jesus said, I have told you all this, that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. Disciples went through a nightmare. 11 out of 12 of them were martyred for their faith. The early church experienced incredible persecution. But they continued, they persevered, they were bold, they had peace, they had joy. Because they took heart. They knew that Christ had overcome the world. Bad news creates fear. 
The good news creates fearlessness. I like Psalm 112. When Psalm 112 starts off with this verse, how joyful are those who fear the Lord and delight in obeying his commands. And if you go a little further, you find out traits of people who fear the Lord and delight his commands. And so in verse seven, we read this. They do not fear bad news. They confidently trust the Lord to care for them. Don't let bad news create fear in your heart. And don't let it steal your joy. Confidently trust in the Lord. Are you sharing the joy of the Lord with others? Or are you sharing something else? It's a, le it's a legitimate question because bad news infects. How many of you know that we as human beings are more likely to share bad news rather than good news? It's a psychological fact. And it's a fact that social media and the bad news channels know and exploit. If you are on Facebook, let me give you a hot tip, never click the angry button. <laughs> because once you do, you will see more stuff in your newsfeed designed to get you angry. Because Facebook knows that you are more likely to spend more time looking at and interacting with the things that make you angry. You probably figure this out on your own. Just think about your own online behavior. Oh look, a cute kitten, nice saying, like, scroll. Bible verse, nice background, like, scroll. Something that offends me to my very core. Angry click. Read article. Read it again to make sure I got it all right. Read all comments. Must write nine page angry diatribe explaining to everyone why they're wrong. Must share with everyone on my friends list. Must individually reply to everyone on the thread and make sure they get their heads screwed on straight. No, just me. I'm on social media. I know it's not just me. You know what? Facebook doesn't care that you're angry. Actually, they do. They're happy that you're angry because it's more time you're spending on their platform seeing ads. <laughs> and you are angrily engaging more people on their platform so those people will see more ads too. They are profiting off of your high blood pressure. It is psychological manipulation because they know that we're most likely not only to respond to bad news, but to spread it. Just think about your own life in the last week or two. How many times did you have a conversation with someone or a group of people where you said something like, uh, did you hear what Trump said? Or did you hear what Newsom did? But when was the last time you said to somebody, have you heard about what Jesus did? Because I guarantee you that what Jesus did is a lot more powerful and long-lasting and life-giving and life-changing than whatever the news grabber of the day has done. Jesus is the story of the day, the century, the millennium, and forever and ever. Amen. See, so many of us are studied up on the headlines of the day and ready to share the new reason for hopelessness. But are we like Peter told us to be? ready to give a reason for the hope that we have. Bad news infects, but good news inspires. Which one are you doing more often? Listen, I'm not telling you not to watch the news or not to go on Facebook. I don't sound like it. Just asking you to be wary, to put things in the right perspective and focus on the right things. And at least know that you're being manipulated for profit. I think at the very least, whatever time you spend reading or watching the bad news ought to be followed by at least that much time spent in prayer and reading the good news. The verse I shared at the beginning, Proverbs 15.30, good news makes for good health. King James Version says it this way, a good report makes the bones fat. I like that. Because a lot of us have been feeding off of a steady stream of bad news that we've invited into our lives. 
And we think we're getting nourishment from this fire hose of information, but let me tell you, that bad news diet leads to malnutrition and spiritual starvation. And you're not you when you're hungry. So grab some scripture. I know, it's so cheesy, but I liked it. Listen, if your bad news diet has led to you being mesmerized, paralyzed, desensitized, or radicalized, then realize that Jesus wants to see you revitalized through the good news. And if you're out there today and you haven't put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, if you have not made him the Lord of your life, if you haven't accepted his freely given gift of eternal life and abundant life, then I want to give you the opportunity to do that in just a second when we pray together. And after we pray together, uh, I'll be up here in the front if you want prayer for anything. Some of our friends will be in the prayer room ready to pray with you. We're all happy to pray with you. And then we're going to sing. And when we're singing up here, can we all sing like we know the power of the good news in our lives? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just submit our hearts and our minds to you right now. And Lord, there's so much information coming at us and, and, and people telling us how to think and how to live. Lord God, I pray that you would just eliminate those voices and we would just focus on yours. Teach us how to live. Teach us how to be. Lord, build our confidence in you. Lord, if there's somebody here that doesn't know you, I pray that not another day, not another hour would go by without them making you the Lord of their life. If that's you right now, I'm just gonna lead you in a prayer. If you wanna accept Jesus as the Lord of your life, you wanna start that journey as a Christian today, then you can pray this prayer right after me. Uh, it doesn't even have to be out loud. God knows your heart. He knows your thoughts. But if you wanna accept Jesus, pray this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I've done wrong things. Please forgive me of my sins. Today, I ask you to be my personal savior. Be the Lord of my life. Help me to turn from my sins and follow you. I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I thank you for rising again on the third day and taking those sins away forever. Thank you for preparing a place for me up in heaven. And if you prayed that prayer today, um, then I just, I wanna encourage you, share that good news of what Jesus has done in your life with somebody else. It could be somebody sitting next to you. It could be me, I'd love to hear it. Uh, it could be a family member, one of your friends back home, but make sure that you share the good news with others. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you accept this act of worship. In Jesus' holy name.